Hello and welcome everybody. I guess you'll be listening to this um, on YouTube a little after the event, but uh, people joining us all the time. Welcome to Cross's Corner and I have with me um, the incredible Kath Bishop, who has joined Hi. me. Hey, hello Kath. Um, who has joined me to talk about her life in sport and amongst other things, uh, life in business, um, life uh in the foreign office but particularly all of these things have coalesced into this uh, amazing new book that you've written Kath The Long Wind which has just recently been published in the UK and is going to be published in the States um, I think is it next week? Mm, that's right yeah and um, I kind of want to, to have a look at how the book um, how the, the genesis of the book came about and and reactions you've had to it and and where, where you think it will take various worlds you talk about the world of sport the world of business the world of education so um first of all could you tell us a bit about yourself because i kind of know you mostly as a role i know about your your other work but just introduce yourself to people perhaps who might not know you that well Sure. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for inviting me on to Crossy's Corner. Very, very happy to be here. I'm going to have to take a photo in a minute just to prove I was on Crossy's Corner because it's a thing. You know, it's a thing. Um, so, yes, we know each other from the days of rowing. I was in the team and went to Atlanta, Sydney and Athens, and retired in Athens. I then worked in the Foreign Office as a diplomat for 12 years. So it slightly overlapped my time in the team. And, you know, I focused quite a lot in that time on issues um, around conflicts, post-conflict, pre-conflict, during conflict, worked in Bosnia and Iraq, um, and I had a really kind of, yeah, fascinating time. And uh, then in the last sort of seven years or so, I've been working in leadership development, a range of things, teaching at business schools, and looking at this question of performance, teams, having had two quite extreme experiences of, of those things. Um, and I guess the book is sort of, yeah, making sense of, of all of that. People, you know, it's often said sometimes people have got a, a book in them and it's just struggling to come out. I mean, how much of a, a realisation was it that you had a book in there and how much of a struggle was it to get it out? Yeah, it's a great phrase. I totally connect with that. Uh, I think I had about 10 books swelling around my head for about the last 10 years. So uh, it's taken quite a while. Um, I think I looked up sort of the other day that I first started writing out the concept of this book in 2017. So it's yeah. been about three years, but I had ideas still in my head before that, but hadn't really gotten down. So it, it's been a sort of on off process since then. And it's taken lots of different forms. And I think there were different parts of the process because there's a personal element to making sense of my experiences of winning I mean the book is about this topic of winning what do we think success is really about so I kind of had to work through some of my own experiences write some of those down and not put those in the book but just to sort of get my own making sense process going and then sort of start layering on if you like how I saw this from different perspectives of my own in diplomacy in business today as a parent as well um, and then to sort of step back and go, hang on, what's the rest of the world say about this? So, you know, a few people that I spoke to and chose to, to kind of interview. And also what's the research telling us about motivation, about performance, about leadership? You know, where, where does this all sort of come together? So it's a multi-layered process. Yes, it's really like a, you've woven in all the threads of your life to make a kind of real sort of an intense tapestry with this book that, that kind of covers almost every aspect of, of what you do and what you think. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an issue that goes across our lives if you look at that broader perspective. So, you know, this concept of, you know, success and winning is very prevalent in education, business, sport and politics. And, you know, and I've experienced each of those areas as well. So, you know, again, it was that personal professional link and then the broader view. And so actually, as I wrote it, the more it the more interwoven it became and that gave me confidence to keep going um and you know in fact you know my publisher sort of had to kind of say stop because you know i could have kept going and could have kept going and there was you know some really interesting stuff i was getting into about how you know the chinese have these 50-year plans and it gives them a whole different perspective on life on politics on government so anyway i'm off again as you can see that it's a rich area and actually part of it was then thinking about how do you organize this in a way that other people can connect with it too and maybe challenge some of those ingrained myths that are still very prevalent and I think a bit outdated now, a bit old fashioned about what winning's about. 
So we can talk about this this concept of the long win and the short win. Maybe we maybe um, let, let's before we get into that. Could you know we texted earlier today and I said one of the things we might talk about was Donald Trump and this this notion of you know the long win and the short win and 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 what. Donald Trump's attitude shows about, you know, the, the US election. What do you make of that? Yeah, my God, it's a roller coaster watching it from afar. I can't believe, uh, I can't imagine what, what people over there are uh, have experienced going through this. But he is the perfect exemplar of somebody who um, lives by and preaches this binary concept of winning. You're either a winner or a loser. There's nothing in between. Basically, winning is good, losing is bad. I mean, it's very shallow, it's very narrow, but it's a rhetoric that's, it's much used. I mean, in this country, you know, our prime minister wants to beat the virus, you know, literally yeah. talked about wrestling it onto the ground a few months ago, which I think is a nonsense. That's not a sensible way in which we as a society can collaborate and work, you know, through our communities to manage this. It's such, it's so much a more complex issue. But yeah, Trump talks winning all the time. And of course, now he's faced with how he manages, how he spins that narrative around losing. Um, thinking about, you know, British rowing has been very much in terms of the, the public focus has been around winning medals and winning gold medals in particular. And, and winning has been part of, uh, I, I, you know, the internal fabric of British rowing. And, and one can think of athletes like Redgrave and Pinson and, and, and Granger and so on, and, and further back to self. Um, where, does, where, where, when you look at rowing, where do you see it as a sport with this focus on, you know, these, these big figures that, you know, particularly like Stephen, let's say, where, and, and even Matthew, I, I think Matthew's publishers in his book, they asked him to write a chapter on losing. And he said, I, I said to Matthew, you know, what was the hardest chapter to write? And he kind of said, the one on losing because he didn't really do losing or so that was the focus so what do you make of these these sort of big titanic figures in rowing and and, and they where they sit on winning and losing and the long win so yeah i have absolute admiration for these figures who achieved far more than than i did and and were hugely inspirational to me to know and still are um, and I think they have been brilliant at exploring the possibilities and the boundaries of what's physically possible. But I suppose I see the team as more than just those giants um, because it is more than just those giants. And I guess that's a little bit of what I want us to think about. The other stories that all of the other people there who are very necessary to push us to win the medals that we won. Um, and I and I sort of care about the experience that everyone has, if you like, in that environment. I think, you know, it can be um, a really tough gig being a spare, being at trials and not quite make it, um, being that, that spare pair that pushes the pair to win the medals. And I am so grateful to the people that I trained with, who nobody remembers now, who nobody cites, who weren't legends, but who had a massive impact on my career and just my development as a person beyond being a rower. And I sometimes feel that we've got the proportions wrong. Not that I don't want to celebrate those gold medals, they are brilliant. And in themselves, they, they speak for themselves. And I don't know why we can't sort of acknowledge the broader team that we are all part of. And actually, I, I think there are sort of performance gains to be had from enabling everyone to thrive in our environment. So aiming for that much more. You you write quite powerfully in your book about the difference between sort of high achievers in the rowing squad. I think you talk about the tickets being handed out at an airport for people that have come back with medals and people that, you know, hadn't come back with medals. And then there's the notion of, you know, the gold medalists being in the front of the plane in first class, flying back by BA, and, and the rest of them sort of going out the back steps with no sort of fanfare or publicity, and the, the winners or the gold medalists coming out the front to all, all the press looking at them. Um, is that something that you still see as a prevalent attitude in, in rowing today, or is that is that something that, that, that was more rooted in a, in a, in a past era? 
I mean, I think this, the specific example of tickets handing out doesn't happen like that anymore. And I'm really, really glad it doesn't happen like that anymore. Now, I mean, I suppose one of the reasons that I felt able to write about this and to, to give some of those examples is because I have seen it both sides. You know, there were, you know, I did kind of later in my career get my ticket handed out first, but I yeah. never forgot what it was like to be to be left standing there already feeling rubbish about having lost the race, but then kind of somehow almost feeling you weren't, you know, yeah, you were, you were of less value because of that result. And, you know, that had a deep experience for me. And I think, you know, having seen it from, from both angles, I, I kind of feel that it's important not to forget um, both of those experiences existed. That particular case doesn't happen anymore, but I think there are probably still elements of that kind of culture that exists, not just in rowing either. I think, you know, we've had this, um, you know, desire to win medals become something that, that goes beyond performance in terms of defining our value as people. And that, that's where it's gone a little awry. I think the experiment we've done for 20 years has shown, um, you know, way more than people thought was possible. And there is, there is much to celebrate there. But as with any kind of performance approach, we need to go what's worked, what hasn't worked as well. And I think there are some elements there around this kind of valuing of people within those high performance environments and rowing is one of them where I think we, you know, we've, we've kind of lost track of um, the values, if you like, that we should have, um, the way we should look after people, not just treat them as a metal machine. And, and we see that, we see that language coming out a lot, that people are talked of, not as, you know, Martin and Kath, but, you know, he's a nailed on metal potential. She's got, you know, she's got some podium potential in next the next four years, you know, all of that dehumanising stuff. I mean, I was really struck when Tom Ransley retired, he wrote a piece, very powerful piece, um, on the BBC Sport website in an interview, I think in the Telegraph as well, about a really dehumanised experience of sitting on the start line at Rio. I've found quite stark, quite shocking to read. That's not really the, for me, a picture of success. And that's where I think we need to define a bit more what does success look like and, and, and is, are there unacceptable levels of success? You know, doping is one, abuse is another. GB Gymnastics is showing us some unacceptable stories of success where people would rather give a medal back, um, you know, if they, if that meant they could change the experience they had. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to, to kind of explore that area more about, do you know what, there are going to be some really, really tough moments here. And absolutely not for making it kind of easy, but that doesn't mean that we can't value people. I, I can see, you know, in terms of... Um business about the winning attitude that, that it's kind of always been there do you think there's a reason why such stories now are coming out in sport you mentioned gb gymnastics i think we talked earlier about um cycling that's had its own problems um rowing too not immune from from those issues in terms of the, the, the culture around the, the, the training base in caversham do you think there's a reason why these stories are coming out now particularly about um you know, a, a culture where winning is everything and therefore the care for the individual, um, the holistic sort of nature and the experience and the fun are kind of sidelined. Yeah, I think um, it's a, all of these things happen when there's a combination of factors that enable it. Suddenly, suddenly there's a catalyst and we see things differently. So I don't know that it's one thing. Um, firstly, we've got space to discuss it this summer because we're not being bombarded with the stories of the Olympics and the Paralympics and the, you know, the, the football tournaments and all of that. So we've actually had a bit of space to step back. Yeah. Um, I think Athlete A as a, as a film, as a documentary was immensely powerful. And that really resonated, you know, internationally within gymnastics, but beyond as well. And I think, you know, it's just one of those moments where suddenly somebody has, you know, in words and pictures shown something that, unbelievable amount of people knew was going on and suddenly said look you know th this isn't okay uh you know and, and and that in itself it's that you know new emperor's clothes moment isn't it where you kind of know it isn't all right but nobody's actually said it so you have those watershed moments and i think we've had the space to deal with it and i think there's a generational thing I think yeah. we've got, you know, that kind of period where, you know, you see this in business as in sport, you know, our generation were willing to put up with certain things. And then actually, as we've got older, we've potentially looked back and gone, do you know what? I'm not happy for the next generation to go through this or the next generation themselves arrive with, you know, a kind of deeper sense of, of you know, how things should be in the future. So there's a bit of an evolution, I think, happening as well. 
and I guess it's that you know breathing, taking stock of 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 you know how we've gone on this this kind of incredible UK sport funded adventure um, experiment. So I think there's a combination of factors. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, and I, and I think you're absolutely right about that. In, in terms of um, the what more is possible, what, what about just sh- giving us a shape of what winning in the long term looks like from your perspective um, and why it's different from winning in the short term? I know that's the first part of your your book where you talk about you know defining winning in the short term and what and what its cost has been. Yeah, I mean, I sort of have three themes. I mean, what what I tried to do is not be too formulaic about it, because I think the whole part is actually we should be all defining success for ourselves. And that's a whole conversation that I don't think we ever had. It was imposed. You're here to win a gold medal. And that was it. And although, yes, I still want us to strive for excellence, to go faster than anyone's gone before, I'm absolutely not against that. You know, it's important for us to, to layer on this sense of you know, why do we want to win a gold medal? What's that going to show? What's that about? What's that proving? You know, why do we need to do it? Why do we deserve to do it? What's the responsibility that comes with that? Should we achieve that? And so it's broadening that discussion, I guess. So the first piece is clarity, clarity of broader success criteria, the meaning underneath the medal. I was really struck, um, you know, for a while. And actually, initially, one of my ideas was to kind of write a book about silver medalists, because there's all this research about how silver medalists are, are the least happy on the podium. Yeah. Because the gold medalists are very happy, but the bronze medalists are really happy. So it's not just a ranking thing. And actually, it's not to do with the colour of the medal. It's to do with your expectations and your comparison points. So your bronze medalist looks at fourth place and goes, my God, I'm glad I'm not fourth. I, I'm really celebrating being here. And the silver medalist looks upwards and thinks, oh, no, I'm, I'm kind of one step off this. Um, and, and, you know, it's in the process of initially of thinking, is this, was this my torment, you know, from, from Athens kind of thing that, that I've taken with me. But what struck me was the number of stories that I came across and that we've all heard publicly of winners feeling empty at the podium or a moment after the podium, of winners saying they felt depressed, of winners then saying, you know, what is this it? And there was recently a brilliant cricket documentary about the English cricket team when they became number one. The, it was called The Edge. I don't know if you saw that. It was yeah, really sure. great, really great. And for me, that's, that's showing the true picture of success. So we can look at the highs and the lows and think, do we want to do this next time or should we try and do this slightly differently? So for me, that was a great kind of exemplar, again, of, you know, let's look at the full picture of success, not some kind of rose tinted image of what we see on the podium. So seeing all these gold medalists kind of feeling like this, I think this is this is madness that 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 moment has become disconnected from anything that comes thereafter or all that went before. And so I think when, when again, when we, when we hunt for the medal, but the medal doesn't have a meaning beyond that moment, that's when you crash afterwards. So for me, it's about clarifying what does that medal mean to you? What is it going to mean for the rest of your life? And also, what are you going to gain on this journey if you don't get the medal? That's a really important question because, well, in 2020, nobody's going to get a medal because the pandemic has, has wiped out the Olympics this year. So if you've got nothing else on your agenda, then you crash. And of the athletes I've spoken to in rowing, but also beyond that, that's what's happened. The ones who struggled most for motivation were the ones who were most kind of solely medal focused. And the ones who've been able to adapt are those who are going, well, you know, my sporting journey is also about this. It's also about this. Or this gives me time now to think about something else, to plan another part of my life, or to actually improve an element of my physiology that I've never really had time to take out from the program and do. So it enables us to be much more kind of adaptable. And I think that's, we have this post-Olympic blues thing that seems to be almost people expect now, oh, that's what happens. Well, that's what happens when you define success so narrowly. It doesn't need to happen. So clarity is the first one, clarity of purpose, of meaning of this sporting journey. The second one is a constant learning mindset, whereby, again, we are really focusing on our, our kind of daily gains, on the improvement process, rather than purely on outcomes. And this is how we think in sport now. For me, this is what helped me in my third Olympics that, you know, in the first two, it was all about you've got to win. Are you here to win? Are you tough enough to win? If you've got a will to win, it was all that kind of really macho stuff time and time again. It didn't make me go any faster. It just sort of tied me up in knots wondering if, well, maybe I didn't have the will to win because I don't seem to be winning. And, you know, it's only when kind of Chris Shambrook really helped bring this sort of performance thinking whereby you're responsible for the performance, you can't control the result. We still want the results, that hasn't changed. 
But you know what, looking at them, wanting them, thinking about them, that's not going to get you faster. Start focusing on the performance, all the things you can bring, all the things you can really improve on a daily basis. So if you become world class at improving, you've got the best chances of getting the best results possible. That helped me enormously to have the success I had at the end of, of my career. And that's something I've taken on afterwards. Uh, but it's a challenge, you know, it's a challenge to see that in, you know, again, the, a lot of the work I do with, with business teams, you know, they start looking at results, everything determines, do we hit the quarterly yeah. figures or not, that determines yeah. whether we're good or bad. Madness. And meantime, you're not improving how you work as a team. So at some point, those results tail off. So again, so that's something I use quite a lot in my work is this sort of real separation out, if you like, that, that you know, and again, in 2020, when I've worked with various teams who are saying, you know, it's a it's a write off that we've lost. We won't hit our targets, our profit margins. So 2020 is a waste of time. Then we have to go through this process of actually thinking, well, no, what can you gain from this year? It would have been much better if actually in January you'd had broader success criteria and not solely focus everything on the results. Because now I have to say, what can you take? Because those are the things that are going to help you to get back on track in 2021 and get the results eventually back on stream or adapt and get the results in a different way. So it's all about this focus on experimenting, innovating, adapting, that in itself, we should see that as a part of success. We should recognize and reward that, even if it doesn't immediately or every time give you results. It gives you the resilience over the long term to maximize the results you can get. And the last part is connection. So the relationships piece. None of us can, see, can succeed on our own. So actually, let's prioritize that rather than be sort of bogged down by lists of tasks, um, and, and sort of become machine-like in the way we work. Actually, you know, it, I mean, yeah. I, one of the things I loved about kind of rowing and I loved about the diplomatic work were there were both worlds that, that were really relationship-based. Actually, I think most of our worlds are. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah. let's, pr let's prioritise that. You know, let's really understand that. Let's, let's kind of build deeper relationships, not transactional relationships. Let's understand each other. Let's harness the different perspectives, have those really difficult conversations and stretch ourselves through actually kind of working with people around us in a much more effective way.